Hello, everyone. My name is Terry Swanson, and I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Serena in a moment. We're here to talk about how point of care fluorescence imaging of bacteria is improving care, cost, and healing. I've been a nurse practitioner for many years now, um, and it's very important for me it, to understand prevention, identification, and management of infection. So we're going to be providing you great details on that. First about Dr. Serena. He is a founder and medical director of the Serena Group, a family wound hyperbaric and research companies. He's been lead principal investigator in over hundred clinical trials and holds numerous patents on wound care devices and dressings. He is recognized internationally as an expert in the field of wound healing with more than 200 published papers and has given over 1,000 invited lectures throughout the world. He's published three medical textbooks and authored numerous book chapters. He's been a member of the board of directors of the Wound Healing Society and served two terms on the board for the Association for the Advancement of Wound Care, or the AAWC. He is now the past president and he's been also vice president of the American College of Hyperbaric Medicine and president of the American Professional Wound Care Association. Welcome, Dr. Serena. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. And Saturday morning, I'm I'm impressed uh, that you're going to hear about uh, fluorescence imaging in the on a Saturday morning. Of course, it's Friday night, and it's Friday night during the pandemic means we might as well have a uh, have a, a seminar because we're not doing anything else. Well, thank you and, and welcome to our viewers today. And it, as you've said, Dr. Serena, it is a Saturday morning, kind of an unusual time, um, but uh, certainly great interest in this topic. So the main questions we're going to have today are about normal assessment processes, but also a technology that some may be familiar here in Australia. Uh, but it's been relaunched in September for the Australian um, market and um, clinicians. So you'll be providing information on what this technology is, how it works, how does it compare with standard care of assessment, and how does it guide treatment planning and assessment and the efficacy regarding that, and you'll provide your information. Well, I found really interesting, besides all the, the, the improved efficacy of treatment, was the improvement in the antimicrobial stewardship, also the cost savings uh, in regards to imaging and how we can improve our cost. So um, I think a lot of people, um, when this device first came out, for those who are familiar, were concerned that this was um, a diagnostic um, uh, technology but what we've learned through your research, I think, Dr. Serena, is that it's an adjunct of therapy. And so we, we look more to uh, hearing about the, these challenges that you've provided and some answers you've provided through your studies. So we all know that there's universal challenges in wound care, whether it's time, cost, or quality. And infection places a huge burden uh, universally on our healthcare services. Uh, but what we forget sometimes is the burden that it places on the individual patient. Increased time in, in hospital, uh, in, increased time with appointments. And uh, in, here in Australia, uh, many times they have to self pay for their dressing products. Now, Dr. Serena, um, there's a premise here that wound infection management is often reactive versus proactive. And uh, how do you, do you, do you think that we, with our clinical signs and symptoms that we have to wait until the wound is blatantly telling us it's infected? Um, is that one of the challenges that we have with just visual assessment? Yeah, I, one of the things we'll talk about when we speak about the clinical trials is the fact that the clinical signs and symptoms has a very low sensitivity for detecting bacteria, particularly at its early stages. So we tend to be reactive. In other words, we wait till the wound gets so has so much bacteria uh, that uh, that then we treat it. Treat it. Wouldn't it be much better to detect uh, clinically significant bacterial levels early on? 
treat it and never have to use antibiotics or, you know, the gorilla cillin that you, you, the patient gets in the hospital. And uh, so uh, it does move us from reactive to a proactive. And one other comment I want to make on that is diabetic foot ulcers. And we saw a lot of bacterial uh, burden in, in the diabetic foot ulcers in our studies. And, you know, we, I always noticed, and uh, Terry, I'm sure you noticed the same thing. Uh, diabetics, all of a sudden, they go from looking fine to having this horrendous infection in just a matter of hours. And you think, oh my gosh, it's because they're so immunocompromised. Well, that's part of the story. It's not the whole story. It's also because there's a, there's a large amount of bacterial, uh, both planktonic and biofilm in those wounds. And so it, it, it just gets to a, a threshold at one point in which to say life. So it seems to us that it's happening quickly, but I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think it's, it's been there for quite some time. We just haven't recognized it. I, I totally agree. And, and I, I had a scenario in clinic this week that just confirms that very readily. I, just to declare, um, as you know, Dr. Serena, um, I'm involved in the International Wound Infection Institute. And my passion is um, understanding um, the prevention and management of an of infection. And we've worked very hard within the um, IWI for the wound infection continuum and developing clinical signs and symptoms. But we know, um, even as we're updating our document uh, for publication next year, is that the signs and symptoms are um, like, like our, you know, our old technology with wound cultures is very limited. But what we are trying to do with that is try to get clinicians to understand that in certain populations, it is very difficult. Now you've identified one with a diabetic foot that um, is very difficult to identify visually. Uh, and that's why you have to take in the whole context to that. Um, so managing these, these budget constraints uh, while providing optimal care has, has taken even on more importance. And all of us trying to um, improve and manage within our budgets. And also now the limitation of, of physically uh, seeing patients. Uh, but we all understand that we're not picking up on the signs and symptoms of wound infection. But can you tell me the importance in more detail uh, on the next slide about cl clinical and examination and how we provide proactive management um, and the significance of bio burden and its implications, that so, microbial density. Yeah, so I, I first of all, I, I really, you know, I, I want to thank the uh, the scientific team at, at, at Moleculite. They, um, they, they came along with me, <laughs> I should say, I drew, uh, and, uh, and we partnered to do uh, what uh, really was um, a challenging trial. And at the same time, the largest uh, clinical trial ever conducted looking at uh, the bacterial burden in, in chronic wounds, a passion of mine, and I know to yours, Terry's, uh, for a very long time. And, uh, uh, and uh, they were very patient with me in, uh, in, in, in how we uh, were developing this, uh, this trial. So I have to give them kudos for that because it really was their, it was their, uh, their baby and I was just very happy to participate. So we did a clinical trial uh, with 350 uh, chronic wound patients all over the United States. And what we found, first of all, it, it was rather surprising, was that 82% of those patients um, had a, a bacterial load greater than 10 to the fourth. Now, and that that level, we know that that's not florid infection. It's not always florid infection, but at that level, we know that wound healing will be impeded. That's been well documented for you know decades. So we know that's the, the crucial level, but it was really surprising that so many patients uh, that uh, had that had that, and we didn't. We just didn't go pick up, uh, you know, uh, wounds, uh, acute wounds, or uh, you know, or the easy ones. So this is. We went into wound clinics, and, and the inclusion exclusion criteria were very broad, and we were able to uh, we were able to just enroll everybody. It really is a real life study. Seventy percent of the wounds, as it states here, had a, had been there for more than three months. And it was, it was pretty much consistent what we'd seen before uh, about this high prevalence. And look at the, when you look at those whiskers pl plots, you can see that it wasn't just, it, it, you can see the line with 10 to the fourth, but you can see that it clusters uh, at much higher levels uh, of bacterial burden. Uh, but, and it doesn't matter which wound it is. Look at venous and surgical wounds uh, and pressure injury. It didn't really matter what wound. 
there's a lot of bacteria. And as you'll see in a minute, the clinical signs and symptoms uh, did not detect it with uh, uh, a high level of sensitivity. So how did you get those uh, bacterial loads? What was the study uh, initiative there? Was it biopsy wound cultures or? So it was a three step, it was a three step process. And I really like this trial design a lot. In fact, we're, one of our next publications is going to be de describing the trial design. So the, the investors came in the investors came in the room and they looked at the wound and then they they would use uh, the you know the IWII scoring system uh, to say if the wound was in, uh, infected or not. If you had three or more um, either covert or uh, obvious obvious signs of overt signs of infection, then it was considered infection. But the investors also say if you had one overwhelming sign of infection. Uh, then uh, that was a positive. So they can't, they evaluated the wound, they looked at it uh, for clinical signs and symptoms, and then they filled out a plan of care, assigned that plan of care, we timed it, turned the page, and then we would do the fluorescence image and look at the fluorescence image and see if there was, you know, you know red or uh, uh, cyan fluorescence indicating greater than 10 to the fourth bacteria. And then they would do a subsequent plan of care. And that a trial plan becomes important in, in a little bit when we talk about that. And then finally, we did a quantitative tissue culture biopsy that was sent to a single laboratory uh, that had uh, that did uh, quantitative analysis of all the biopsies. So we had, um, uh, so we, it really was, uh, in, uh, you know, I, I, it wasn't my trial design. I wasn't the first one to do it. So, uh, uh, but it was really well designed so that we could get, get the information we wanted. Well, as a, as a clinician, um, just looking at, at this slide, it is quite significant for me. Uh, and when we were just talking about, um, you know, under treating or over treating um, uh, based on clinical signs and symptoms, this has significant uh, implications. And we have the references there on the slide for you. So we'll, we'll now talk about um, the, you know, we have a high microbial burden, but it, it isn't just confined to delayed healing. Can you provide in greater detail how um, undetected um, elevated bacterial burden impacts on wound care in general? Well, I think this is uh, I think this is this is uh, obvious. I think most clinicians know this, but I think it's nice to kind of go over it. So the longer it takes to heal, that's our first one. Longer it takes someone to heal, the longer the more it costs. We know that. Um, you know, we've studied that pretty extensively in the in the U.S. The idea is to get them healed as fast. And, you know, that also goes to you know education in the community as well. The longer it takes them to refer into the wound clinic and get evaluated, the longer it takes them to close. Then obviously you're going to it's going to cost more if there's more complications. Uh, if you do an advanced uh, modality such as a graft. Uh, skin substitute or uh, even negative pressure or other modalities, uh, and you have a high bacterial load, they, those, those more expensive modalities may not work very well. So um, uh, you're going to, be, again, use more hospital resources. And then we'll talk about antibiotic prescribing and antimicrobial prescribing. But it, I have to tell you that based on clinical signs and symptoms, antibiotic and antimicrobial prescribing is really haphazard at best. Uh, and uh, wound sampling techniques uh, well, they're expensive, and we just published a paper with Greg Schultz uh, and uh, Phil Bowler, and really looking at your laboratories, the ability of your lab to diagnose an infection by culture, and it, it really is very poor. Uh, now, in, in ours, we did tissue biopsies, and they're truly quantitative, but your lab doesn't use as a semi-quantum technique, and usually it's based on a swab. Those are very, very inaccurate. Uh, and that was a surprise to me too. I didn't realize the level to which that, uh, the inaccuracy. So I think you can see that, uh, uh, that having an elevated bacterial burden, certainly having an infection is going to increase the cost uh, to the health system and to the patient themselves in, in complications and longer treatment times. I know when you look at that figure uh, in the US, uh, more than 10 billion annually. So we have to look at strategies to, to improve that. Um, and we know that wound culturing is an old technology. It's over 150 years old. And certainly in my facility, Dr. Serena, uh, we, we don't uh, get that quantitative analysis. Um, and so it is flawed. Um, and that the efficacy of, of doing it can also be influenced about how the clinician prepares the wound to do the culture, where they culture. Uh, so how we do that also inf you know, impacts on that, that flawed um, ability. 
And I frequently get results saying that the wound is colonized, but then I say, but you should see the patient, you know? And, and I know clinicians who actually send photos uh, to the lab to show that, you know, dig a little harder. And we can improve that by providing more information for our microbiologists. But, um, you know, it, it's very imperative that, that we try to do that better. But this is, I think, the, um, the slide is showing about the study that you've done with uh, Professor Schultz and, and uh, Dr. Bowler. Can you tell me more about these objective methods? So uh, we had a lot of, from the study that, you know, having that many patients and having biopsied at least each patient once, sometimes some up to three uh, times, we had an enormous number of uh, bacterial isolates from those wounds, over a thousand. So we had a real opportunity uh, to look at them. And the other thing was that uh, the FDA, and I don't know why the FDA required it, but they did. They, they said, you must do semi-quantitative analysis as well as quantitative analysis. And I'm sure, I'm sure that was to the dismay of the, um, the CEO of uh, Moleculite. However, uh, it, it turned out that it turned out to work out very nicely because, at, you know, after we published the main uh, manuscript, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Renee and uh, Anna D'Souza and I you know, sat down and said, you know what, we have over a thousand bacterial isolates. We can actually compare this. We can actually do a follow up. And then I asked uh, uh, Professor Schultz and Dr. Bowler to join in. And and uh, I this this is one of my favorite uh, uh, manuscripts. Just to be honest, uh, it it is a it looks directly at semi quantitative and, and versus uh, quantitative. And we just put a little snippet of it in the bottom there. And what you see is this really broad range. If I send if I do a semi quantitative, uh, 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 this is a biopsy, not even a swab. Okay. Swabs are worse. Um, uh, you can see that light growth can range in this case you know, from, you know, basically 10 to the third, almost all the way up to 10 to the sixth. It's a huge range. And that's light. You wouldn't treat that. But there, you may have, you may have, you know, you may have 10 to the fifth in there, which is highly significant, or you may not have anything. And we found this consistently throughout almost all of these, uh, all these semi-quantitative analysis, the same analysis that your lab does. And it just, you know, if you, if the microbiologist haven't had his coffee in the morning, you know, you could have a, it could be 10 to the fifth, but if they're at the end of the day, uh, it might be 10 to the third. And so I'm not blaming them. Please don't think that, but no. it's just an inaccurate way of, of measuring wound bio burden in chronic wounds. And I have to tell you, we've, you know, based on this and even before this, uh, you know, we've completely abandoned. I can't remember the last time that we did a swab culture of a wound in a wound clinic. We've completely abandoned it based on, um, based on this. And if you really want to you do a, a semi-quantitative culture, I can save you uh, some time. It's uh, a little less accurate than flipping a coin. And then, uh, you know, if you have a quarter in your pocket, it'll only cost you 25 cents to make the make it just as accurate a determination as a semi-quantitative uh, analysis. And, we, and it was really great that we were able to show that uh, in, in very dramatic fashion. It's nice to have that, that um, evidence uh, to support what um, I've been teaching for years and is yeah. that, I mean, we don't um, treat the, the wound results based on the lab results. We treat the clinical signs and symptoms. Um, but it's nice to know that, uh, you know, we can, uh, if somebody says, well, why didn't, why didn't you uh, swab Terry? And I just didn't feel it was warranted. Many times it's just academic. So when I do a wound culture, it's just, uh, I'll, if, if required, I'll prescribe and treat empirically. Um, yeah. But I just want to make sure that what I've prescribed, um, that the, the wound doesn't have bacterial resistance to that. So that's excellent evidence for me to use going forward, Dr. Serena. Yeah. And I think you'll see the advent, you see the advent now of molecular diagnostics. And uh, I think the combination of fluorescence imaging and molecular diagnostics may play a role in the future. If you're really worried about whether the patient should uh, receive, you know, systemic antibiotic therapy, I can't give you the answers on that. that that those trials are just starting uh, now in uh, in the U.S. So uh, next year's conference, we'll we'll talk about that. <laughs> so. All right. Well, we've got a Wounds Australia conference in September in uh, 2022. So <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. On the next slide, we talk about um, the clinical signs and symptoms cannot accurately detect. And so we we talked a little bit about that. And so sometimes clinicians, we've just talked about, have a difficulty in determining when to culture, um, how to culture, when to treat and, and to diagnose. And, and currently we have the 
inaccurate or flawed uh, wound culture system and, and um, our clinical signs and symptoms that may not be as accurate. But you've explored this paradigm uh, with your colleagues and what was the conclusion from that? So this is, uh, if you look at this, you know, the, if you took the, uh, the wounds uh, in, the, in the study that was done and you look at those that were graded with no clinical signs and symptoms, there they are in that whisker plot. So 10, uh, you know, 10 to the fourth and above, those, are, those had significant levels of bacteria, yet the investigators called them negative. But it also happened on the, you know, it, 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 there were also a few cases on the, on the flip side of that where they said there were positive cases for clinical science symptoms when they weren't there, when there, was not, there, wasn't, uh, there wasn't a high level of bacterial burden. There weren't as many of those, but it's, it went both ways. And, uh, and this will lead into our discussion in a minute about, hey, look, uh, the, you know, uh, it, it, how can you prescribe antibiotics? How can I develop an antibiotic stewardship program based on these uh, findings. I, I can't really tell if it's negative and I can't really tell if it's positive. So why, how am I writing uh, prescriptions? And I, let, I'll leave that to a little bit later, but um, you, you, this is one of those things where you, where you, you see the data. And I'm one of these investigators, by the way, so this is me too. <laughs> so I, I, my eyes aren't any, aren't any better than anybody else's. Well, that's right. I mean, we're only limited by our skill and assessment. Um, our years of experiences, our intuition about these patients. Um, and so we're using the best skills and knowledge that we have, but now I think we might have some insight as some, some these future technologies, and actually they're not future, they're current technologies that can assist with that. And I, I know in the um, Australian context, um, in, in my clinical practice that I see, some clinicians have a lot of difficulty in de determining the difference between inflammation mm -hmm. and infection. And, and I, I see a lot of antibiotics being prescribed for lipodermatosclerosis um, in, in the acute phases, uh, not, not differentiating that inflammation versus infection. So I think, again, you know, that objective information. What I forgot to do for our viewers is tell you, if you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A section. Um, Dr. Serena and I will try to answer them during uh, the conversation, as well as uh, certainly we'll have time for questions and answers afterwards. So the next question, Dr. Serena, is so the clinical signs and symptoms um, visually are uh, flawed. So um, how flawed is it? The next slide shows uh, some um, outcomes from your uh, research. So the, now, first of all, I just wanna say that we still are gonna examine the patient. I, I don't, you know, oh, yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's important, I think, uh, just to get it out there. We, you know, I, I still examine the patients, you know, every time I, I see them. I just, I think the important thing is if you're a chronic wound specialist, you need to realize that there are limitations to your uh, clinical signs and symptoms. And you can see that you miss, uh, you know, highly, you know, high, high levels of bacteria in wounds uh, somewhere between 50 and 85% of the time. So you're really, uh, you're missing a lot of, uh, uh, of highly uh, back wounds that have a high level of bacterial burden, a burden at which it, you'll impede wound healing. So if you're trying to get the wound healed and say, well, I don't see any signs of infection, but that may, uh, that may not be the case. And this wound may not be healing because there's 10 to the sixth, 10 to the seventh, uh, you know, uh, CFU per gram in that wound. And it's really healing because there's too many bacteria, but we just don't know it. Uh, we just can't see it. Uh, and, uh, and you really can't treat something you can't see. So we, we know that um, a wound that is healable, um, that if it starts becoming stagnant or hard to heal, as it looks like most of these, these pictures that you have here, are wounds that are hard to heal and certainly show sign of chronicity looking at that. And uh, that we do uh, aggressive uh, cleansing and, and, and manage of that. But we do um, rely on that holistic assessment. So first we have to determine that one, that these wounds are healable uh, and then manage the, the host or the, the patient symptoms that can contribute to that. Then when we've managed that and they're still not going on to hard to heal, then we have to look at, at that microbial, 
microbial load. And so we've been suspecting that for a long time. We've known since 2008 about biofilm. But again, we can't see that. And most of our cultures can't pick that up. Um, but what I find interesting about um, th this, uh, the studies that you're doing is that not only is it on the wound, but it's the peri wound. And we know that there's those populations, uh, whether they have low flow or they're immunocompromised or either through disease or medications, that they will not present with those classic or overt signs. So uh, again, objective information. Um, yeah, just a, um, a word on the peri wound. So for years, you know, we're, we have these very busy wound clinics and we're seeing, you know, 60, 70 patients a day. And I'm always kind of hurrying up the, um, the nurses and uh, who are absolutely fabulous and um, moving them along. And uh, so, and, but they're always being very nice and cleaning off the peri wound. And I'm always like, forget the peri wound, just put the wrap on, let's go. And then I started <laughs> doing these studies and, and the peri wound's lighting up like a Christmas tree. And now I'm like, make sure you clean that peri wound as if it was my idea. So, uh, but uh, they were, uh, my nurse, as usual, my nurses were right all those years. Uh, it just took a, it just took fluorescence imaging for me to realize it. Oh, I love the conversion, Dr. Sorry. <laughs> All right, our next slide is talking to us about um, the haphazard, haphazard prescription of antimicrobials. Huge cost, um, both to the patient and the healthcare system. Can you just talk to us a little bit more about this? So this um, manuscript, and I would encourage everyone to get a copy of it. It should be coming out in advances, uh, advances, advances in wound care. Um, the, the Wound Healing Society Journal, I mean, hopefully this in October, maybe November, uh, it's accepted, it's ready for publication. I don't know how long it'll take to get out, okay. but uh, it, it's really, it's, it's another uh, manuscript I think we're pretty, uh, pretty proud of. Uh, and we looked at, um, you know, uh, first, you look at, at, at the square, their bacterial loads, uh, you know, uh, whether you're, you're CSS positive or CSS negative, it didn't really matter. Uh, it didn't matter if you were positive or negative, whether or not you got antibiotics. So if you look and then look next to that, which I think is amazing. So, uh, you know, antibiotics, uh, the percentage of antibiotics in which antimicrobials was prescribed, if you're less than 10 to the fourth, it, again, it it didn't, it didn't make a, if you're positive, well, most of them got it, but if you're negative, 90% of them still got antimicrobials, even though uh, there was no, uh, no significant level of bacteria. And similarly, if you were, uh, those that got antimicrobials and antibiotics, look at 10 to the eighth. Now that's a lot of bacteria. That's huge amounts. You know, uh, Marty Robinson said, used to say active cellulitis was 10, 10 to the fifth or 10 to the sixth and greater. And so you're way into the infection range range here. And these numbers are almost exactly whether you were positive or negative, you, were, you uh, received antimicrobials. It really was amazing. And it, it, you can't look at that data and say, uh, there's, there's a method to the madness. There isn't. It, antimicrobial prescriptions uh, at, at this time are, are haphazardly prescribed. Uh, and we just don't have any guidance. We've got to do better. Now, there are some reasons for this. I, I mean, some of it is the fact, I think some clinicians realize that there's a limitation to our clinical signs and symptoms. And so they we we tend to you know uh, we tend to overprescribe. I'm worried they might get infected, so I might overprescribe it. And that's really when you talk about stewardship, that's really where we've got to get to. That's a that's the mindset that has to be reversed because you know otherwise the the rest of medicine and our ID doctors are are going to come down and can come down on us wound doctors pretty heavily for overprescribing uh, topical antimicrobials and antibiotics. I don't know how it is in Australia, but uh, you know we have to have and you know it's mandated now to have stewardship in your wound clinic. Uh, so we have it within the hospital. Uh, when we had our last audit, they certainly looked at my prescribing patterns, um, which I received accommodation for. So um, <laughs> yay for me. <laughs> um, We've got some questions, uh, Dr. Serena. I didn't know if you want to uh, take them now when we're talking about uh, antimicrobial sure. or so. Um, this first question is simple contamination of a venous leg also is very different from tissue infection. Does the moleculite differentiate between that? 
So uh, the moleculite is actually picking up. I mean, you have colonization. Uh, um, uh, it, it can't differentiate between planktonic and biofilm, but what you're really seeing is is prime, predominantly biofilm based bacteria. It's not it's not colonization. It's not colonization, and we were able to we we able to show that in all these in, in these studies. Moreover, I think what is really telling about that is. You know, I remember the first few of these patients I did, I took the image. We did a pilot study before we did the main trial. And I, I take that first image and I see some red and I say, give me my scalpel. I'm going to get rid of this red. And I, and I would debride it aggressively. Diabetic also, I'd take up all that callus. I'd take the margin of the moon. And we take another image. And it was, it, the color was deeper in more color. Debrima, I can tell you right now, debrima does not remove uh, uh, all of the bacteria in the wound. Not even, not even, it, it takes, it takes several weeks of debrement plus, uh, you know, topical antimicrobials to get rid of that bioburden. You can't get rid of it on one shot. And that really was the, that's what really told me, we're not dealing with colonization here. We're dealing with deep-seated bacteria. We're dealing with biofilm uh, and, uh, and something that is a challenge to get rid of. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've subsequently published uh, about, I think it's three or four manuscripts now, where we looked at the length of time it takes to get rid of that fluorescence uh, with uh, topical antimicrobials and debridement in combination. Uh, yeah, I think we're I think we're at three. We'll, be, well probably the end of the year, we'll have five or six publications looking at uh, various agents and and their ability to uh, reduce uh, reduce that fluorescence image. I think any time that you have a healable wound and um, it's not healing, it um, has to be more than just contamination and. Uh, I think most of the, the experts would agree that biofilm would be a culprit. And, and we know that that, um, that proteinaceous um, exudate from a venous leg ulcer really feeds that, um, that biofilm yeah. in that area. Well, so the same author uh, also asked, uh, do you see any value in short course topical dilute antibiotics like denomycin to de decontaminate the wound and possibly allow epithelialization to proceed more quickly? With how so, oral uh, antibiotics. Now, this is very much a U.S. because we have a different take on that here in Australia. But I'll let you answer that. I personally don't use topical antibiotics because their 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 range is too narrow. The broad their spectrum is too narrow. Uh, and I will tell you, mate, you you're looking at uh, you're looking at the reasoning right in front of you, uh, and that is that you know you need guidance on uh, on. Uh, I, I I do a lot of empiric topicals. I did. I used to do a lot of empiric topicals, and in particularly new patients. Uh, and really now I've gotten to the point now where you take the image uh, and then you treat it based on the image. Um, it's a validated, uh, fluorescence image is well validated and, and the positive predictive value for red and, uh, uh, and cyan fluorescence is almost 100%. If, if it's red or cyan, it's, you've got a significant bacteria that needs to be addressed. And I think catching it early is the key point. I think this goes to the yeah. question. Catching it early is the key point because then I can do it with debridement and topical antimicrobials. And what we see, I think uh, we're going to hear from Nadine later, and she's going to talk about how her antibiotic use over two years dropped precipitously. And we're we're seeing the same thing in the U.S. Antibiotic usage uh, antibiotic usage is dropping like a stone. Yeah, uh, and certainly we don't use a lot of uh, topical antibiotics here. Maybe. Uh, some of the, the plastic services still resort to that, but it's certainly not a, a general practice. I think we've got some images uh, uh, to show people who've never seen some of these uh, images before. I think the next slide. Um, so you were talking about visualizing bacteria. So this is for the viewer for the first time. Some of them may be seeing this. So can you just talk to me about this wound that we're seeing, Dr. Serena? So this is a, a diabetic, obviously diabetic foot ulcer in, uh, from one of our clinics, one of our uh, patients in the clinical trial. And um, he has a wound that's been there for a little less than three months. Uh, he started, it was a poorly fitting shoe wear. Uh, and he's fairly young and it's a, you know, it's not a great big uh, ulceration. This is a, remember, this is a, I had to qualify this a little, uh, you know, I, this is a kind of a close up picture that I took. So mm -hmm. um, it, it looks a little bigger than it is. But the investigator in this uh, debrided the ulcer and then looked after the debris and said, you know, I don't see evidence that this, uh, that there's a lot of um, bacteria here in, in any portion of this wound after my debris. And that's, that's pretty much what the investigator said. But then. And, <laughs> but then, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so <laughs> surprise. So uh, what, and this is something that really surprised me. And this is this, that we call this the ring of fire. Uh, and that this is post debridement. 
So this is not pre debris, but this is after the callus and edge of the wound have been roughed up. And what you see is this uh, is this very bright red fluorescence indicating, you know, a bacterial uh, levels greater than 10 to the fourth. And I would tell you at that level, red, at that level, red fluorescence, it's, it's way more than 10 to the fourth. And we see in diabetic ulcers that it tends to, the bio, it tends to go to the edge of the wound. And our biofilm ex experts have told, told us, you know, it's funny because we were in a meeting and I presented this and one of the, uh, one of the biofilm experts in the audience went, we've known that, that biofilm sticks to the edge of diabetic foot ulcer for years. And I was like, oh, well, okay. Why didn't you say it? So I think um, I can uh, guess who that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, and uh, so, but it was a it, it was a it was a good exchange. And uh, yeah. but we now actually, and maybe it's just because I had to see it to believe it. But you see this, and this is not infrequent. This is um, this is a very frequent finding in diabetic foot ulcers, which is why you know continuous treatment and the use of um, uh, topical antimicrobials to treat these is is so important. It's it it's. Uh, it's very hard to diagnose uh, bacterial bile burden uh, and biofilm on uh, on clinical signs. Again, the sensitivity is you know below twenty uh, percent. Dr. Sheridan, I think you know uh, my colleague, uh, the biofilm expert, is, is correct. We've been teaching this and knowing this for a while, but have we changed practice? And the mm. answer would be not a great deal to get that aggressive um, cleansing. But I just recently uh, was listening to a webinar uh, about this technology. And one of the, the panel members uh, said that before you debride this, but you fluoresce it, you can get a halo of that. Do you, mm -hmm. Can you explain that a little bit more to me? Uh, and say, she was saying that that was an indication that once you debride that you would probably get these deeper tissue Images? Yeah, oh, yeah, so you do. I mean, you first when you, you take the first image, and this is this is what I did classically in the in the trial, uh, in the early trials too. We would see the uh, you would see a softer red blush uh, around the edge of the diabetic ulcer. Give me my scalpel. I mean, I'm a surgeon, so I'm going to cut it. Yeah. So and I just go after it, and then you re-image it, and you see this. It uh, and uh, uh, our biofilm expert colleagues tell me that this. Oh, of course, this is biofilm. What you're seeing is biofilm. It is. It's it's at the edge of the wound. It's attached there. It's subcallus, and simply removing callus is not going to remove the biofilm. And uh, again, it was uh, you know uh, it was something I just needed to see visually before I really um, uh, took it to heart. Yeah. So it's that layering of evidence that is the key to changing practice. That and there's something about an image. You know, you can talk and talk and talk, but there's something about seeing it that really does. Uh, capture the imagination and is an impetus for change. So we'll talk more and, uh, about, yeah. No, that's also true of your patients too. I mean, I show the, the ones that want to see it, show it to your patients and say that reds bacteria, that's, you know, you need to, you know, uh, you need, please leave my dressing on and, you know, don't, don't take off your walker, uh, fixed ankle walker. I mean, so it, it's also, it may, you know, patient education is, you know, for us, that's huge right now. A big focus on patient-centered outcomes and patient education uh, in the U.S. And uh, so this is an, a feedback to your patients as well. Uh, look, this is what we're looking at. This is why we're doing, you know, this is why we are doing this particular therapy. And it's immediate feedback. Yeah. Um, you can visually say, you know, here's the, the before and the after. Uh, I think the next slide talks more about, um, for our viewers who are not that familiar with the technology. Um, so we have, it's a busy slide, but can you just talk us through some of the, the images and, and explain the technology, you know, this violet light, how does it help us give us this information? So uh, let me walk you through the way we use it in the clinic. So uh, what we do first is we take a standard image and it's just a regular, you can see it there um, uh, in the uh, in the middle. What the, uh, that's just a regular photograph that you could take. The neat thing about it is that it has a measuring device within it. So uh, you can see 0 0.33 centimeters squared. So uh, if you use the dots, then you can, then the, the, the device will be able to uh, give you a, a surface area Measurement, which is really nice because that get, that's sort of an added feature that is just uh, that's, you know, uh, it's not fluorescence. It's not telling you about bacteria, but it, it, it serves another purpose. Right. Because now I've now I've got a nice way to very accurately measure the wound uh, in in a device that does that who, whose primary versus purpose is is something else. I like that as a really nice feature. So we do standard imaging. We measure the uh, we measure the surface average 
area. And then uh, you, you flick the switch and it'll uh, turn the lights off or put a dark drape over the wounds. And uh, so it's gotta be dark. There can't be any ambient light. So now you okay. darken the room. Uh, and uh, then you flip the switch um, and it shines a violet light. It's not, a lot of people say ultraviolet. I've heard that a lot lately, but it's not ultraviolet. It's 405 nanometers. Uh, and those of you who remember your uh, electromagnetic spectrum and your physics. Um, I only know this because I, I have two, two uh, my, both my sons are in physics, uh, physics programs in college. So it's a dinner table conversation is always physics. So um, anyway, it's 405 nanometers. And uh, uh, when, uh, when the porphyrins or pyroveridines, those are the uh, kind of the hemoglobin equivalents in bacteria. It's also how bacteria transfer resistant genes. Uh, and when they get, when they are exposed to that wavelength of light, they vibrate and they emit their own light. And that light is uh, for almost all, you know, 28 known bacterial species is red. And then one species has a cyan halo type look, and that's Pseudomonas because it doesn't have porphyrins. It has pyroveridines. So that, way more information than you need to know. You can read more about it if you have a, a distinct interest in, uh, in that. Uh, I think that's super interesting. And, and that's how we get the, the, the fluorescence image. You can see, you see um, either a red, as you see on the right, or you see on the top of that venous leg ulcer, you see that really bright cyan halo. Uh, and that's Pseudomonas. And uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, you can, you, so you can differentiate that. But most bacteria uh, will have a uh, red fluorescence and then Pseudomonas will have the cyan. And there's something about you have to um, make sure that you don't have a, a white um, under uh, cloth to it. Is that correct? Yeah, I'll give you some. Yes, yeah, so there, there's a bunch of little hints. Don't have a lot of blood in the wound. So, you know, uh, that's not a good idea. Now, blood doesn't show red. It shows kind of a darker color. But some of the er, some of the inexperienced investigators got blood confused with um uh, okay. with, uh, with uh, the blush and it's, it, it, it's not. Uh, and then, you know, it's a lot, if you have a big white, uh, bottom to it, uh, it, it, it causes the, it, it causes the image to be, it causes the image to be a little bit different. It's not, it's not horrible, but just as a matter of doing, I always, you know, I always take the white under, you know, uh, uh underneath dra uh, drape under off of, so I want to do the fluorescent imaging. So I think a lot of those problems would easily be overcome when you have the training for the technology. Oh, yeah. The rep comes in and, and helps set up and, and, and takes you through those, those little nuances. So, so that's an excellent and, introduction to the technology. And we have, a, and we have nurses in our clinics that do this uh, lickety split. I mean, it's amazing how fast, how good they've gotten it. Uh, you know, I, I'm like, oh, tell me when you're done. Well, I'm done already. You know? <laughs> And, and so, um, uh, and uh, this whole light on, light off, light off thing is also good if you're in the clinic because you know, light goes off, you know, they're taking the fluorescent image. Uh, although oftentimes I'll take the fluorescent image myself because sometimes we'll do debridement underneath the, underneath uh, video fluorescence. So that, that leads me to the other question is that I, uh, we have some image um, further down uh, talking about the video capabilities of this as sure. well. But I want to move on now to your flag uh, clinical trial um, because uh, you were involved in this and it, it appears to be a very significant study. So can you tell me more about it and some of the significant points of the study? Sure, eight months of my life. So uh, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a tour de force, great investigators. Everyone did a great job, a great support from the folks at Moleculite. Um, so uh, we had 350 chronic wounds, uh, 20 clinicians across the United States at 14 uh, clinics that, all, that ranged from university setting to uh, you know, a clinic in East LA. So it was a, really a wide range. We took all comers. They were very, I think we had two inclusion, two exclusion criteria. It was very, this is really a wow. real world trial. And then what we did, as I stated previously, we assessed the wound for clinical signs and symptoms, the investigator right out of treatment plan, we then took a fluorescence image, and based on that, uh, we would uh, we then uh, uh, wrote out another treatment plan, and then we'd do a biopsy. Now, if we found an area of fluorescence on the uh, fluorescence image, we biopsied that area. If we didn't see any fluorescence, we biopsied the middle of the wound. So uh, we were able to get uh, uh, we were able to get bacterial uh, uh, data from you know all of the all the wounds, and some of them had up to three different biopsies because you. We might have fluorescence here, fluorescence there, uh, and uh, we could do up to three biopsies per uh, per wound. And so the next slide shows us uh, more about how having that information then influenced um, your changes to treatment. Uh, and 
I have to say, Dr. Serena, um, I was quite amazed that 69% of the study treatment plans changed. Um, that's significant. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a real it was a real eye opener for everybody, and you know, it was it was fun to watch the investigators go through this process at each one at a time as we were doing these studies, and uh, uh, like oh well, look at that bacteria there, and uh, uh, and you know they would do debridement and they would do more debridement uh, uh, and use more uh, you know focused topical um, antimic uh, antimicrobials, which is why you know when they, we asked them about stewardship, they said over half the time. They thought the fluorescence image influenced their uh, opinions on on stewardship. And on the left hand side, you can see that the sensitivity for just CC, uh, uh, just clinical signs and symptoms alone was pretty was was not great. It's less less than twenty mm percent. -hmm. But you add on to that uh, fluorescence imaging, and you can see it goes up by about fourfold. Um, and I can tell you, when you get experience, uh, it goes up a lot more. So it was not just. Um you know, the, the, the change in practice that included other components, um, you know, the wound bed preparation, um, improved wound assessment. Uh, so it was, and it was, as you say, a real world exploration. Yeah. We did not have real tight inclusion exclusion criteria as many of our trials do uh, for, you know, uh, for many, many reasons. But for this one that we were fortunate that we were able to take you know, sort of all comers. Excellent. So that, as you know, begs the, the question, uh, now that you have the fluorescent imaging, um, how has that influenced your clinical workflow or how have you integrated that in, into the next, uh, into your everyday practice, which the next slide shows um, how one might use it? So yeah, you can see how the, the, the flow goes here. Uh, you know, you get, you, it's part of, now it's just part of what we do. I, I will tell you that after, you know, after a week or a couple of weeks of, of using it, it's, you're like, oh, why didn't we have, it become, really becomes part of the clinic. Our clinics that have had it for a while, uh, we have a number of clinics that have been using it in regular practice for quite some time. And it is, it just, it's just a, a simple part of the flow. Uh, you know, you clean the wound, you capture a fluorescence image, you debride it, uh, and then you recapture a second image. And you also, you got to do a standard image uh, to, after the breathing anyway. Uh, so we go ahead and get a fluorescence image uh, and then you select uh, whether or not you're going to use something antimicrobial, uh, and you know uh, whether you're going to, um, you know, bring that when you're going to bring that patient back to be seen. Now, for the most part, we bring our patients back weekly, and I, I I believe it's in the presentation. But we also have a consensus, a Delphi consensus document that really goes through this workflow. And I'd suggest if you once you get your molecular device, uh, grab that paper. And uh, uh, what we did in our centers is we took the the flow, and, and we kind of blew it up into a poster. And we just put it in the clinic. Ah. It's real nice when you're first, when you're first, um, you know, using it. After a while, you won't need that, but it's 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 kind of nice. Uh, the patients actually like seeing it too. So it's a, it's a nice little diagram. All right, so we'll move on and, and delve deeper into into that that these concepts of workflow and how it's changed practice. And one of my key campaigns for a few years now, Dr. Serena, has been wound hygiene and and cleansing the wound. And uh, Dot Weir and I have done a lot of presentations together because I've said quit anointing wounds and she says clean it like you mean it. But you've got imaging that shows more emphasizes why we should do that. So what about this image here, the standard image? So yeah, guilty. I, I'm guilty of, <laughs> uh, of like, let's just treat the wound and let's not, you know, forget the wound hygiene stuff, you know, that's a, uh, so, um, and, and uh, there, there's nothing like a picture that'll change your mind. Uh, and uh, you look at this image and certainly I already, I've already cleaned the wound out. You see, it looks pretty, okay. it, it looks pretty nice, you know, so it looks pretty, it looks okay. So there's the, you know, the, uh, where I, I had done my hygiene part. And of course my nurse is like, you're not done yet, you know, and, uh, I'm like, oh, yes, I am. So, uh, but then you take an image and you can see, um, oh, wow, that's a lot of bacteria in the peri wound area. Uh, I, I don't, we don't know the actual significance of that, but it can't be good, right? I mean, I, I don't need a clinical child to tell me that's not good. Uh, so obviously uh, this is going to contribute to the bacterial burden in that wound. And that needs to be, um, you know, that's, as you, as you said, clean it like you mean it. And, uh, and I think that that's a, that's a good adage, it's a good mantra. Uh, and and I, I, just like the ring of fire, when you see these peri wound uh, areas, uh, you realize that uh, wound hygiene, peri wound hygiene is really of paramount importance. 
So just to, to reemphasize for people who are new to the technology. So this ring of fire means what now? There's a microbial density of what? And so my, the, ring of, the ring of fire is just for diabetic foot ulcers. And it's, it, it's, the, the, it's most likely biofilm that goes right around the edge, oh, okay. of, the, around the edge of the ulcer. And it's red, even, it's red even after you, you, after you debride it. Okay. Um, and what we're seeing here is really that, that something's very common. And that is that the peri wound has a large amount of bacteria uh, uh, present as well as, you know, as well as can be in the wound itself. And, and again, that goes to, uh, you know, looking at that and saying, oh, well, you know, I need to, I need to provide better hygiene uh, for this, uh, for this peri wound tissue and the wound itself. So you cleaned it again. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, so we, we understand the importance of the wound and the peri wound. We've talked about how debridement doesn't fully re may remove tissue, but doesn't fully uh, remove the bacteria. So the next slide talks about targeted debridement. Yeah, this is really a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I do this more and more. We do a debridement under uh, with, you know, with a, uh, with the video on, and you can see that you're actually, you're taking, uh, the, that, that callus off and some of the, she, she also takes some of the wound margin and, uh, you'll see the, uh, the red fluorescence on the, on the caress. You're actually removing, uh, that, um, that bacterial burden. Uh, and we do this more and more. I have, I have a couple of doctors that do this. They do most of the breeding like this? Uh, but it's, a uh, it, it's a nice way to, know uh, to guide your debridement uh, as well. I and mean, it's, it's kind of fun. What I find interesting as, as a clinician, because I would be doing this as well, is that it appears um, an undetected sinus um, is noted in that, that corner. Um, sure. uh, yeah. And that may not have been picked up with the naked eye. And so it emphasizes again, how important the, the debridement is, but also the enhanced visualization. So that, that's what that video says to me. Sure. Uh, and so it helps you target not only where, but, but how as well. So this brings us to this, these guidelines that you, you've been talking about. Um, and it, it has significant implement, implementation uh, importance on new practice and research because we know there's a lot of lag between what the research tells us and, and actually coming into to our clinics. Um, but you've got together a, a group of well-known experts that I can see from this list here uh, from the US. So tell us a bit more about these guidelines and, and how using the point of care fluorescence. So we were looking for a consensus among um, uh, you know, wound care uh, acknowledged published wound care uh, clinicians in the US. Uh, who ha actually had experience with the device. So it wasn't just, uh, we just didn't open up. You had to have be using it as well. Okay. So, uh, uh, so, and uh, we did a Delphi process for those who may not be familiar with that. You, you ask questions and you try to get consensus on them and you have to get a score of 70 or above, 70% of consensus or above where the question goes out. And uh, it was, we, this was one of the, uh, probably the easiest Delphi I've ever done because we got <laughs> consensus in two rounds and everybody seemed to be thinking wow. on the same page. And uh, it was actually surprising because uh, most of the time that you can't, you know, especially as it, it, not to disparage my, my own specialty, we get a bunch of surgeons in the room and no one can agree. So, <laughs> so, uh, and, but we, that, that's not the case here. I mean, you know, um, uh, we, we had surgeons and nurses and, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, multi-specialty groups, uh, everybody who was uh, using the device and we were able to get a good consensus. All right, so the next slide shows some clinical indications of when would we would use it, but two really captured my attention. And so they're, they're highlighted here in yellow. Can you talk to me more about those? Yeah, I'm not gonna read the whole list, but you, yeah. the, you know, so, <laughs> We like it with and before and after debridement. I like to know how much of it. Yeah, I got it. There's a study that we published uh, again earlier this year that showed that it, in about ten, between ten and seventeen percent of time, you can get rid of the bacterial uh, burden with uh, a topical uh, antiseptic wash and debridement. It's the unusual case, but you can. So I always image before and after uh, debridement, and like I said, sometimes we'll do videos of it. And then before you use a. Uh, uh, you know, the cellular tissue-based products or skin substitutes, as they're often called, uh, or even a skin graft. We, we're, we're imaging all of those 
uh, wounds because we don't want to put a, uh, a graft on something and then have the have it uh, become very expensive bacterial food. Uh, and uh, so I think it's important, and it's just part of good wound bed preparation. Yeah, and and the next slide will talk more about um, application. Um, and and so for just remember uh, for the viewers that we have the uh, references listed for you. This I, I looked at these photos, and um, I have to say that you know currently here in Australia we we work to prepare the wound for the graft or for the cellular tissue products. Um, and, and that's a given. So we use antiseptics, we use negative pressure and debridement prior to that. But we do have failures. And when that failure occurs, it's disheartening um, to the patient. You know, the expectation that this is finally going to close the wound after months of, of therapy. Um, and it's a cost to the service. And how many times do you repeat that? So. I would welcome um, taking this into my theaters, and not that I'm doing the graphs or the or the CTPs, but with our surgeons and um, saying before we put this on. So you've done some studies with this, but the, these photos just yes. speak volumes to me. Can you talk yeah. to that? It's your, it's your whole photo thing again, right? It's, it's <laughs> yeah. exactly that. I mean, um, so uh, this is actually done by one of my partners, uh, junior partners, uh, 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 Kara Patel. And he, he, he uh, put the graft on. This is a week later. And he said, oh, man, that doesn't look very good. It's gray. It doesn't look very good. And so he said, this is early on in our use of the uh, fluorescence imaging. And he said, oh, give me that. Give me the can. Hey, give me that. And he, he, he grabbed it and uh, took an image and then sent it to me. This is actually from these photos are actually from my cell phone and um, and, and they're published. Uh, and you can see all the red fluorescence indicating a high level vector. So now we know there's no doubt why this thing yeah. is failing. Uh, and uh, so uh, and it was shortly after that we made a routine practice to image all of these patients pre grafting. Right. Great. So I'm going to have to take this paper back to work <laughs> and, and, and do some, uh, be, become a change agent, I think, to improve, um, you know, as I said, you know, the cost of a failed graft of, of whatever type uh, is significant. And, but I also see the, how it severely impacts on, on, on the patient themselves. Well, I'll tell you something else. So we, we uh, have 20 of these devices and uh, in our clinical trials, uh, we don't put on experimental graphs or products of that nature without a negative image. So it's become, we've also, in addition to incorporating the clinical practice, we've, we've said, look, if we're going to expose a patient to something that's experimental, uh, we got to make sure that we know that it's yeah, free of, that we've done good wound bed preparation. Yeah. And so that's now become part of our, you know, that's our routine research practice. That's excellent. So the, the next um, uh, slide that I'm going to talk to is, is, uh, done by uh, Nadine Price, and she's a uh, researcher uh, and podiatrist in, in the UK. And this um, research uh, won the uh, British Medical Journals Award diagnostic category uh, from her study from 2020. And this has led to a change in practice, which we've just been talking about um, for a lead in podiatry. And what um, she did was um, review uh, prospectively year one and she and we have a video of this but i just found it um significant um her results and the international efforts which we alluded to earlier dr serena about antimicrobial stewardship and how um we are reaching a crisis point for that and we're making efforts through that uh, antimicrobial stewardship but her um i'll start the video in a minute but her findings from this um, was significant in regards to antibiotic usage, um, improved healing, but yet no increase in the antimicrobials. So uh, we'll play the video and I'll have the viewers uh, draw their own conclusions. As a podiatrist working within the National Health Service in the UK, I treat foot ulceration on a daily basis. These wounds put a substantial economic strain on the healthcare system. The NHS spends almost £970 million a year for the treatment of these ulcers and any related amputations. Much of this cost is driven by wound healing time. So the longer a wound is open, the more resources are required to manage the wound. 
as clinicians, we'll often use antimicrobials and antibiotics to manage bacterial burden and infection, but it's widely recognised that these are often overutilised. As antimicrobial dressings represented our highest cost burden, I first wanted to evaluate how the addition of fluorescence imaging to our standard wound assessment would impact our use of antimicrobial dressings. I also wanted to understand the impact of fluorescence imaging on wound outcomes. And so to do this, I assessed the 12 week wound healing rates. To evaluate the impact of fluorescence imaging procedure, I conducted a retrospective observational pre and post intervention analysis. For the analysis, I compared antim antimicrobial prescription and wound healing data from two time periods. The first time period, which is referred to as year one, includes information collected prior to the implementation of the fluorescence imaging procedure. The second time period, year two, includes information collected after fluorescence imaging was added to our routine clinical assessment. In the year prior to using Moleculite, 85% of patients were prescribed antimicrobial dressings and two thirds were prescribed antibiotics. In addition to this, we observed wound healing rates of 39% and an amputation rate of 18%. In the year after fluorescence imaging was incorporated in routine wound assessment, we saw a 49% decrease in antimicrobial dressing prescriptions, along with a 33% decrease in antibiotic prescriptions. This reduction in antimicrobial use coincided with a 23% improvement in the wound healing rate, and the amputation rate in year two remained comparable to year one. Before the fluorescence imaging procedure was introduced into the clinic, the total antimicrobial dressing expenditure per year was about £2,300. In the 12 months after fluorescence imaging was introduced, the total antimicrobial dressing expenditure decreased by 33% to £1,531. This decrease occurred despite a 27% increase in the number of wounds seen in year two. To account for the difference in the number of wounds treated over the two-year period, antimicrobial spending was normalised to the total number of wounds assessed. Per wound, antimicrobial spending fell by 47%. From £22.68 to £11.96. Wound healing rates are impacted by many factors that contribute to the total cost of treating foot ulcers. To estimate the impact of routine fluorescence imaging on the total annual wound care costs per patient, I applied the healing rates observed in year one and year two to the known cost of wound care reported in the 2018 study by Guest et al. In their retrospective analysis, guests and colleagues analysed data from 130 diabetic foot ulcers across the NHS to determine the average cost of care for a foot wound over a 12-month period. The average cost of treating a healed foot ulcer was £2,138. The cost of treating an unhealed foot ulcer was four times as high, while the cost of treating a foot ulcer resulting in amputation was almost £17,000. These varying costs were multiplied by the healing and amputation rate data we observed in year one and year two. The total cost of wound care based on standard care alone was estimated to be around £7,662. The incorporation of fluorescence imaging in year two was associated with a 23% increase in wound healing rate, which estimated to a total cost of £6,900. The 23% increase in wound healing observed in year two amounted to an estimated cost of £762 per patient. So in conclusion, the results of this retrospective observational analysis showed that the routine use of fluorescence imaging for the identification of high bacterial burden in wounds is a useful diagnostic procedure. It can be associated with a reduction in antimicrobial dressings and antimicrobial prescriptions, improved wound healing rates, and the improved detection of high bacterial loads in wounds, which reduces the clinical and economic burden to our patients and the NHS. What a significant study. Um, here in Australia, we have a, a similar health system. Um, and in this cohort of patients, you know, this very complex uh, group uh, who is an ever increasing burden on the healthcare system, if we can take modalities to identify and manage to give that um, holistic assessment and treatment program um, is impressive. And I congratulate her and her group on, on that study. Um, you've also um, presented some uh, wound outcomes as well, Dr. Serena, uh, through this Delphi process um, and the impact of imaging. So the next slide, um, you know, we've just heard from the video, but 
can you give on on your experience with your outcomes? Uh, well, this is actually the outcomes of 32 clinicians uh, uh, from across okay. the U.S. And uh, 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 although I participated too, so <laughs> it counts. Uh, uh, the so most people felt that it improved wound healing, and I can tell you that. Uh, you know, it, the molecular device is part of our stewardship program. And although we're behind Nadine in gathering the data, uh, it's, it, we're noticing the same trends. And I think that most of the uh, clinicians also felt that amputation rates were going to fall. And we'll, you want, yeah, as uh, Nadine and uh, the, uh, the folks in the NHS, as uh, Terry and uh, your group, groups down in uh, Australia, and uh, so we continue co to collect more information, I think you'll find amputation rates falling as well. And that's, that's our whole key. Um, if we can save a limb, save a life. And we, and we know the mortality rate five years for those who have amputations. So early detection, uh, early intervention and proactive management are absolutely key. And it's wonderful to be getting more practical information, if, if I can be so bold, to, to uh, apply and be change agents with, within that field. So besides the impact on the wound outcomes and cost savings, Dr. Serena, how else do you think this uh, imaging technology may benefit our, our patients? And noted in the next slide. So, uh, I mean, this is actually a patient brochure and uh, the clinic, our clinicians in, uh, in the clinics love these brochures uh, uh, and the patients do too. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, Patients like this technology, uh, and I, I and uh, as I said before, you know we have had a lot of conversations um, through our wound care collaborative group uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, Vicky Driver and Lisa Gold or uh, Peggy Dawson are running, uh, and uh, and we it, they that's allowed us to have a lot of interaction. And, and I got to tell you, more than once, our our you know CMS Medicare has said to us, you you need to get more patient the patients more engaged. And you need more outcomes that are uh, that make them happy and uh, uh, and uh, and give them a better quality. Even if the wound's not healed, you need to have patient-centered outcomes. And, and this is this is a nice start towards that. I mean, patients a they like the feedback very much, and uh, they like the fact that they're not going to be exposed to antibiotics. They're you know they particularly with diabetics, they don't want to take the, these antibiotics. And uh, in treating the infection, oftentimes odor, it goes, odor and infection go hand in hand, and uh, and that's a that's a, a major win for some of our patients. And you know, in fact, we've even engaged Medicare and said, look, if we did a clinical trial in which odor reduction was the was the endpoint, would would you look at that? And you know what they said? They said yes. And wow. so I think it's that's very powerful uh, that that uh, you know and we you know, we're we've been stuck for so long with healing as the as the uh, as that endpoint and now uh, we have payers uh, saying look uh, what the patient how the patient feels about the treatment is is very important and, and you're going to need diagnostic tools and uh, tools like mo uh, moleculite in order to do that if you got if that wound's full of protease and it smells like you know the Dickens uh, you're uh, you know you can make that patient's life a whole lot better but simply getting rid of that bacterial burden. Yes, I agree. Um, in, in regards to patient engagement, I've heard other uh, panel members saw in, in previous webinars talk about how um, they show the, the images to the patients and uh, the before and after. And, and so next time they're like, can you do that thing you did last time with uh, that, that camera? Um, and it helps explain why we need to, to debride. And then clean again. So it's, it's worth the time and the effort. And um, their reports also uh, coincides with yours that it, it improves and increases that patient engagement. You know, we did so a clinical trial. We did a clinical trial with a, a debriding tool. Uh, and uh, we looked at fluorescence imaging before and after debridement uh, with that tool. And one of the patients in the trial, just a short story, uh, uh, we had we were seeing them weekly, we we're debriding weekly, and we we're taking images. And unfortunately, she got admitted to the hospital right around right at the end of the trial, about the fourth week into into the, this four week trial uh, for a completely unrelated issue. And uh, they consulted the inpatient team. It wasn't one of our hospitals. They consulted the inpatient team, and uh, the doctor came around and. Uh, was getting ready to do a debridement and he said look she, the patient said look you know first of all you didn't take an image first so you don't know what's there and second of all you know it, yeah you if you I, i'm just going to wait till i go back and and to get to it there <laughs> so that, that surgeon wasn't terribly happy with us but it, I, the patient themselves said look i 
I want my care direct. This is the care I want. You know, I want, standard. I want, I want standard of care. I want, I want the technology that's going to tell me what, that you're doing this for a reason. Yeah. I, I love when we empower and our patients find their voice. That's a great story, Dr. Serena. So we're coming to a, a, a close for this. So then I want to talk to have you tell us what your key takeaways are regarding, um, you know, your numerous trials um, and on your patients and just some of your key takeaways for us uh, today. So, uh, you know, so I, you can't detect what you can't see. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're always going to examine the wounds. I mean, that's important. And uh, my the fellows who I'm always harping on about that would, would shoot me. Uh, uh, they have me, uh, you know, I say don't examine the wound, but we, but we know that there's limitations to clinical science and symptoms. So you need additional. One of the things I didn't mention is we just finished a study where we had very experienced um, uh, investigate uh, uh, molecular users do a study, and it actually their their ability to detect bacteria in the wound went up eightfold or elevenfold, sorry, elevenfold really a jump so you get really these are these are individuals that have been doing it for, for years now and okay. so that you get better at it uh and uh and uh, i we always say uh i always say an image is worth a thousand swabs they changed it to words uh but uh, uh either way i think that's really true i mean and we've we've talked about how how it, it the image has taught me personally a lot uh teaches my patients and my a lot and certainly the uh, you know, I've learned some, some very valuable lessons. Just look at that prairie wound example. You know, that was a valuable lesson that I learned uh, that um, despite uh, all the uh, all the times that my nurses have told me that, you know, that they're going to clean it anyway, uh, that prairie wound, I finally have given in because I saw it. Uh, and then again, the nice thing is this point of care, something we really haven't mentioned is that you wait three days for a culture and I don't wait three days. We're going to have to treat these patients at point of care, true, truly valuable diagnostics need to be point of care uh, and 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 done in real time. And I think those are the the, the key key uh, key takeaways to this uh, uh, program. Thank you uh, for your time and effort today, Dr. Serena. Now I'm just going to inform the viewers um, that if they're interested in uh, the technology that we provided, the next slide provides you with contact details, so you can have more information for the Moleculite and arrange for a demonstration. Um, in Australia or New Zealand. Um, also, if you're interested in doing a, um, a formal uh, uh, clinical analysis or, or, or um, study uh, to also let them know. So I provide you with those contact details there. So it is available in Australia uh, so that um, you can have a demonstration or trial or um, discuss with the team uh, doing more advanced studies uh, such that you've done. Anything else before we go into uh, the question and answers, Dr. Serena? No, I think uh, we can see what folks have had to, had to ask here. Okay. Uh, so we've got uh, one uh, uh, author who, uh, well, thanks us for the presentation. Uh, we're glad to be here. Is there EMR integration? So this is electronic medical records. Um, I don't know if you can answer that here in Australia, but maybe uh, some of the others could answer that for you, but can you give your perspective in the United States, Dr. Serena? So we do have EMR integration in the U.S., uh, uh, it, it, and it's not universal yet, but we have integration in the ER, and I can tell you, this is an iOS platform, so uh, I can put it in your EMR, <laughs> so, <laughs> and I've done it, uh, so it, 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 you know, you can save these images very easily, they, they can go and they can uh, transfer into your EMR very so easily. USB, doesn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you can, USB, so you can, yeah, you can, uh, you can just, it's, it's like an iPhone. You can plug the, it in and plug it into your computer and download the images. So, and okay. I know what the legality of that in Australia. I'm going to take, <laughs> that's my disclosure. You, you don't, don't have to understand legality. our legalities. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, uh, this is something that um, can be worked through. As I said, yeah. if, you're, if you have inquiries um, about the device and how it integrated, um, we, um, and the next question is, does the device generate a written report that it can refer back to for longitudinal care between clinicians? Uh, it generates an image uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, and you get the wound size in the image and that's what we use. We kind of put them up serially in, uh, in my clinic. That's what we do. We, 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 we put them up and so you can look at them all uh, in a row, um, we, and, but it doesn't have an actual report other than, yeah. the, what, we, other than what we chart. 
I, I think um, some of the, the other webinars, um, the nurses talked about how um, they had to input that data as far as the, um, the length and the width. The, the device does not give you depth. You have to do that independently. Yeah. Uh, but it does give you uh, static videos that you can upload or you can take a, an image of the image and then upload, mm -hmm. depending on if you want to use that, that sort of system. Um, and then, but you have to generate your own written report or uh, input that data to my understanding of it. And, and uh, the, um, the company can inform us if, if that's incorrect. And so what is the inter-rater reliability of the image interpretation? Oh, that's a very so interesting question. So if you look at the clinical trial, it's very high. I mean, it's, uh, you know, there are, there are only in 350 images, I think we only had four where we, uh, we, we overread the investigators. But the interesting thing is there is a little inter-rater reliability based on your experience. So if you're a newbie to it, um, your ability to detect, uh, it, it just, it's not in the device, it's in, it's in your eyes. It's a, it is your ability to detect the blush and the, or the cyan. And as I said before, experienced, um, experienced uh, interpreters do much better than, not much, but somewhat better uh, than novices. So there is a sort of a learning curve that you'll, you'll go through as you're doing through image interpretation. And uh, the company um, is usually very good about helping you with that and giving, giving examples. And, you know, uh, I think that's, there's another role for Boons Australia and the societies uh, to, to have that type of education. Uh, available, but if you're just taking two two novices or two experts, it's incredibly uh, re repeatable. So, if I may, so a person who's who's like any other new acquisition of skill, um, that there is a learning curve, but um, you can use those even in the early days with a level of uh, confidence and competence. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that the company, uh, when you're having a, a demonstration, that the, the reps will support you for a day or two yeah. in yeah. overcoming those obstacles, decreasing the, the rate of false positives uh, due to how you implement that um, visualization. Would that be a it, correct it, summation? It's correct, and it's not really an issue. Yeah. I mean, you're still, uh, even, even if it's the first time you've ever seen the device, you're still four times better than signs symptoms and then it, that'll go up as you get more experience uh, with it uh, uh, and uh, you know so uh, women see more red so uh, you make sure that uh, you have a woman around to help you with in, uh, interpretation and the other question there was about colorblind and I think they are coming out with a colorblind version uh, in the future oh, really? so wow. yeah so um, yeah it's a uh, you know so uh, uh, more to come on that okay so that the, fourth, the last question is, New South Wales Health AMS system doesn't allow non-medical prescribers to use the system. A reference list would be beneficial to build case for expansion of AMS to other prescribers. So I think that's kind of more out of the preview of, of, of the panel today, uh, mm -hmm. but it's a good point um, that uh, um, antimicrobial stewardship um, will... Um, expand uh, to, uh, and, and currently in my experience here in Victoria, it doesn't, um, that antimicrobial stewardship doesn't, uh, it's purely just antibiotics. It's not uh, to um, uh, topical antimicrobials, such as the other studies that, that you've done. Um, and certainly um, the antibiotic usage within our facility, um, we can't capture what happens in the community either, where a lot of this prescribing is actually occurring. And that would be great to see some information about what those prescribers are doing, because I think the evidence suggests that by the time they get to a specialist clinic like mine, they've probably had two or three courses of antibiotics. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And we see that too. Yeah. All right, so there's no further questions. Um, Dr. Serena, it's been a pleasure. Um, I look forward to exploring this technology here in Australia. So I thank you for setting the groundwork with that high level of evidence uh, that you've provided uh, through your team. Um, the information that we have from the UK, I think uh, our Australian um, clinicians uh, can be confident that um, as an adjunct of therapy, it is something certainly worthwhile to explore. Um, and, and see how it fits into their practice. Well, thank you for having me. 
Yeah. I look forward to seeing you at the World Union, hopefully. Oh, yeah. We'll see you soon. Okay. We'll have actually, actually get to see each other again. <laughs> That'll be good. That'd be nice. All right. We'd like to thank you all for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak to you this morning or this evening, depending on where you are. Um, and we thank you for your time and efforts and for the company allowing us to talk about this important topic. Thank you. All right. Ciao.